All right, good morning. So we did this last week, see if you still got it. He is risen. That's right. As, uh, as Rebecca said, the resurrection is something that we celebrate all year long because we serve a Savior who is risen. And his resurrection doesn't just have power on Easter Sunday. His resurrection has power to transform every place in our life. And for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about families. We're going to be in a series called The Intentional Family, and the resurrection has power to transform our homes and our relationships and our families and our parenting and our relationship with our spouse. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I'm not married, I'm not planning on getting married, and I definitely don't have kids. This, this series is still for you because we're preaching out of God's Word, Ephesians 5 and 6. And, uh, and, and some of the principles that we're going to be talking about, just living lives of intentionality, have application in our spiritual growth and in our relationships with other people. But, you know, it's important that we preach the whole counsel of God. And so we talk about money because the Bible talks about money. And we talk about marriages because the Bible talks about marriages. And we talk about raising kids because the Bible gives clear instruction on how we raise and train our children to grow in the grace of God. And so uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at, at some of these things together. And we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21 today. And then we'll continue uh, with Ephesians 5 next week and then Ephesians 6 the week after that. But we're calling this series uh, The Intentional Family. And we're going to be talking about what it means to become an intentional family, to have intentional relationships. Um, here's the thing. Intentionality uh, simply means that, that we do something with purpose, that we're deliberate, that we're conscious, that we're present. Intentionality is, is kind of a buzzword in our culture, right? We talk about being intentional with all kinds of things, um, but man, it's really important in, our, in the most important relationships in our lives uh, that we are intentional, that we are purposeful, that we are present, that we are active, that we are conscious, that we are deliberate. So we're going to look at this passage out of Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, and it just kind of sets the groundwork for the next couple of weeks because these verses that we're going to read, they don't directly uh, speak to our family life, but they speak to our lives as believers, and, and then it leads right into what Scripture says about our family lives, our marriages, and our parenting. And so these principles, they kind of lay the groundwork. And so this morning, we're going to kind of lay a foundation. We're going to lay some groundwork on becoming an intentional family. So let me read the passage, Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into God's Word together this morning. Here's what it says, starting in verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is truth. Would you transform us? Would you change us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you speak to us through your word today? Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. We submit to your word in these next few minutes. We give you this time in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Well, we're going to talk about becoming intentional families. And it starts out right out of the gate uh, in verse 15. By the way, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter uh, in, to the church in Ephesus, and, and he starts right out in this passage, and he says, pay attention. Everybody say, pay attention. pay attention. Turn to your neighbor and say, pay attention. Pay attention. Turn to your other neighbor and say, pay attention. Pay attention. 
Paul is, is trying to get our attention. He, he's saying, look, listen, listen, I'm going to tell you something that's important. As we think about family life, right, have you ever, you know, maybe your kids have been talking to you and you stopped paying attention because the story just kept going and going and going and going and they got to recess and they lost you at recess and then they got to snack time you're just like or maybe you've been talking to your spouse and it's clear that they stopped listening to you you know they kind of got that glazed over look maybe just maybe that happens a time or two in here maybe kids your parents have been talking to you and you stopped listening and they just kept talking and they were just lecturing you and you're like, ah, I'm 15 years old. I know what I'm doing. Just leave me alone. <laughs> right? None, none of our students in here. Or maybe, you know, parents, you've been talking to your kids and they're on their phone or they're on their Nintendo DS and, you, and they've, just, you know, or I guess that the Switch, I think, is the thing now. I've lost track. And they're not really paying attention. And Paul speaks to us and he says, hey, pay attention. Pay attention to how you walk. He's telling us to be intentional with how we walk, how we live our lives. The, when he says walk, he's not just talking about walking down the street. It's important to pay attention where you're walking. Have you ever ran into a wall? Anybody ever done that? Or ran into a pole like you're not paying attention and you're just boom. Anybody ever ran into a sliding glass door? I've done that hard before, and that is not fun. It's very embarrassing. It's very funny to watch if you're not the person. Uh, but Paul says, pay attention. Pay attention. When I was in middle school, um, probably tw over 13 years old, I used to work every summer at a summer camp that my grandpa owned. My grandma and grandpa ran this summer camp, and I would go work all week. And they would give me 50 bucks at the end of the week. And it was like incredible, you know. Um, but I remember one day I was walking through the camp after all the campers had left. And that was the time when we cleaned up and we mowed the grass and we picked up all the trash. And I was pretty tired by the end of the week on Friday afternoon. And I'm walking and probably had my head down, you know, kind of dragging my feet. And my grandpa said, come here, son. He said, hey, when you walk, you keep your head up. You need to see where you're going. Said leaders walk with their head up. Nobody wants to follow somebody who's not paying attention to where they're going. And I never forgot that. I was in like seventh grade and still to this day, I'm careful when I'm walking, I have my eyes up. I'm looking where I'm going, paying attention. And that's true and that's important in our lives. But man, it is really, really important in our closest relationships. If you were a, a husband or a wife in your relationship with your husband or your wife, if you're a parent in your relationship with your kids, if you're a kid in your relationship with your siblings and with your parents, in your closest friendships and the, and the people that you work with, it's important that we're paying attention. So Paul says, pay careful attention then to how you walk. And then he says, it's not as unwise people, but as wise. In other words, there is wisdom in paying attention. Do you want to be wise? Sure. You, you, if you don't want to be wise, then we need to talk. You should want to be wise. The, the alternative to wisdom is foolishness, right? Nobody wants to be a fool, I hope. So Paul says, pay attention. There is wisdom in paying attention. And so it's this idea of intentionality. Strong family, strong marriages, strong kids, they, strong homes. It just doesn't happen by accident. And so this morning, we're going to look at five practices that will help us to cultivate intentional, healthy families. And so we're going to kind of break down these verses. I talked about verse 15, which kind of sets up this passage. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. Then verse 16 says this, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Making the most of the time. Everybody say, make the most of your time. Make the most of your time. When we think about growing in our intentionality in our families, in our homes, in our marriages, in our parenting, the first 
principle to cultivate is this, make the most of your time. Did you know that time is the most precious commodity that we have? Like when time is gone, it's gone. You can make more money, you can make more friends, but you cannot make more time. Like when it's, when it's gone, it's gone. And Paul says, look, make the most of your time. And the King James Version says, redeem the time. In other words, buy back the time. And he, he continues, he says, because the days are evil. In other words, we live in a, in a time, in an era we always have. The days just kind of tend towards nothing. Right? If you, if you think about all of the time that you've wasted in your life, <laughs> Just think about, all, you know, so many of us as, as we get older, I remember, um, you know, as a college student and then as a, as a, as a young man before I was married, I, I, I had all kinds of time, but I didn't know I had it until I got married and now I'm accountable to another person. I was like, whoa, I should have I got a lot more done. And then after we were married and we had kids, like we thought, oh man, we should have got a lot more done. And now my kids are growing up. My oldest is 16. She's driving. She'll be a senior next year. We have some younger ones too, so we're going to be doing this for a long time. But man, time flies. All of, right? We've heard all those things. The days are long, but the years are short. We've heard that stuff when it comes to parenting relationships. And Paul just says, make the most of the time. There are a lot of things we can spend our time on. We can spend our time on hobbies. We can spend our time on work. We can spend our time on ignoring everything around us. <laughs> Paul says, look, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time because if, if you're not intentional with how you spend your time, then your time will just go right out the window. It will be gone before you know it. And you will lose some things along the course of time if you are not intentional with your time. See, small investments over a long period of time have a cumulative effect. Any relationship that you have, just to say every day, I love you. Over the course of time, all those I love yous add up. On the other hand, neglect also has a cumulative effect. If you forget to say, I love you every day, over the course of time, those forget to say, I love you add up. If you spend a little bit of time with your kids every day, it adds up, it has a cumulative effect. If you ignore your kids every day, it has a cumulative effect. So I have these two plants on stage and for the next three weeks, we're gonna kind of do a little science experiment Okay, how many parents love science experiment time with your kids where you get to do their homework for them? Yeah, so, um, so here's what we're gonna do. This plant on the right, we're gonna water. I, I got these uh, fiddle leaf figs because I looked up and it said they're really hard to keep alive. So this is gonna work good. Um, so we're gonna water this one and this one we're just gonna ignore. And we're gonna see what happens in the next three weeks. I don't know how long it takes these things to die, but I think, you know. And we would never think of our relationships like that. We would never say, well, I'm just gonna intentionally ignore. But it's what we do when we don't make the most of our time. Why? Because the days are evil. If we're, not, if we're not capturing, redeeming, making the most of every opportunity, then we are losing opportunities because the days are evil. It's kind of like if you're in a river in a boat with no paddle. You just go wherever the river takes you, and it might take you over a waterfall. It might take you up on a sandbar. If you're not redeeming the time, making the most of the time, so small investments in our marriages, in our parenting, in our relationships with siblings, in our relationships with friends and coworkers, small investments have a cumulative effect, but so does neglect. It has a cumulative effect as well. And you can't make up 
for lost time. Uh, my wife, she, she is a disciplined person. She likes to work out. So she gets up early, works out, and uh, I don't. I'm not into that. That's not my thing. But I know I should. So about three times a year, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to work out. <laughs> and the way I do it is because I haven't worked out for, you know, four months, I need to get four months of working out in today. And so I run further than I should go, and I do more than I should do. I, I remember one time uh, I was on summer vacation, and my brother-in-laws and my brother and my dad, they were like, let's go work out. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. And so we went, and my, uh, my brother-in-law, Wes, he's really into CrossFit, and he's like, yeah, we're going to do these kettlebell swings. And I threw my back out like second swing. But I'm with my brother-in-laws, and I can't, like, let them, you know, show me up. So I just keep going, ah, you know, I'm dying. And I can't do it anymore, and then we were doing push-ups, and my back is killing me. So I thought, well, I'll just go get on this elliptical, and I'll run while they're working out. And so I put it on highest resistance, and I, you know, and it was one, you could hold it and hold the handles, and it would tell you your heart rate. So my heart rate was like 190, 200. I'm like pushing myself hard, and they finished working out, and I'm now seeing stars. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I had to go downstairs to get out of this gym, and I'm like holding on to the rail. And I thought, I will never work out again. So sometimes that's what we do in our relationships. Like we ignore, we neglect, because we're busy, because we got work, because we got things to do. Because who likes to watch elementary kids play soccer? I got to mow the yard. You, yeah, you go do that. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh man, I got to fix this. And we try to jump in and, and you know, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And that's not how it works. I'm gonna, we're going to get so much quality time today. Today's the day, guys. This is our one day a year. We're going to get quality time today. That's just not how it works. You can't make up for lost time. The way that we get quality time is by just quantity time. Quality time happens kind of on accident most of the time, right? It's those moments when you're sitting around the dining room table and all of a sudden everybody's laughing and you're just, you remember those moments and you don't know why somebody said something or, you know, your kids are laughing at you, but it's this wonderful moment. And it just kind of happens by accident when you make the most of every opportunity. And that's how we become intentional families. We make the most of every opportunity. We don't just say, okay, here's my schedule. We got to cram it in on this day. It just doesn't work like that. Now, there is hope. You can start today. Maybe you've lost some time. Start today. And I don't mean cram it all in today. I mean, start small investments over time for a long period of time and it will pay off. Have a conversation and say, hey guys, I'm sorry. I haven't spent the kind of time with you that I should. To your husband, to your wife, I'm sorry that I haven't spent the time I should. To your kids, I'm sorry I haven't spent the time that I should. To your parents, to those closest to you, I'm sorry I haven't made the most of the time. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So our first practice to cultivate is making the most of your time. The second is this, seek the Lord's will. Verse 17 says, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We need to seek God's will for our homes, for our families, for our relationships. This, this kind of speaks to our values. What are the things that we value? Now, we live in a world, we live in a culture that wants to tell us the things that are most important. We live in a world and culture that wants to give us its values, that, that wants us to, to follow where it's leading us. 
But if we want to have intentional, healthy families, then we need to seek God's values. We need to seek God's will. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, there are some values that are good things, hard work, financial stability, fairness and justice, peace and comfort. Those are good things. But sometimes we allow those things to get out of whack. We try to pursue those things by our own means instead of by God's means for us. We can make work and financial stability more important than God's will for us. We can make peace and comfort more important than obedience and sacrifice to the Lord. We can make fairness and justice more important than trusting God. We can want our kids to get into the right college and get the right grades and play on all the right teams, but we're not helping them to grow, to know, and to love the Lord. There's good values in the world, but we need God's values. We need to seek his will. We need to seek his purposes. So here's a little exercise, okay? Here's something for us to do. Um, when you get home, maybe take a little values assessment for yourself and what are the things that I value the most when it comes to my relationships, family, home, and then Ask your spouse, what do you think our values are as a family? What do you think our values are as a family? And that might get a little dicey. <laughs> but then ask your kids, what do you think our values are as a family? Hey, kids, what do you think mom and dad, what do you think is most important to us in the world? And that could get a little scary. But we need to understand what the will of the Lord is, to seek his plan, to seek his direction. In what ways does your home reflect your values? In what ways does your home reflect the things that are most important to you? Um, <laughs> we used to have this poster on our wall. It was near the dining room table. It was one of those Hobby Lobby posters, you know, like this home is fun and crazy and we love each other and we forgive and we laugh and we, and so um, one day uh, we were at the dinner table and it was one of those moments where I just wasn't really looking for fun and loud. I was looking for peaceful and let me eat. And, uh, and, it was one of those moments where my kids, like, they were laughing and it got bananas. And, and I, I, I may have been less than gracious. I said, guys, settle down, okay? And my son, Jeremy, he said, but dad, and he started reading the poster to me. And I thought, <laughs> I didn't. and then we were all laughing, and then I started laughing, and then we were all laughing. And it was one of those moments that we'll never forget. And we still talk about that poster. The irony is that my crazy kid who read the poster to me also knocked the poster off the wall and broke it so we don't have that poster anymore. <laughs> um, and I made sure that we didn't replace it with the same poster. I think we got like something like, peace, be still, I don't know. <laughs> That's not true. Um, but like, how does your home reflect your family's values? Are there Bibles laying around your house? Like, is there a place where you read your Bible every day and there's just a Bible there and your kids know that's where you go to, to read your Bible and to have quiet time with the Lord? Do you have, do you like practice hospitality in your house? Do you have people over to share the love of Jesus with? Like, what are the values? How does your home reflect your values? Something to think about, something to talk about, maybe ask some questions, have a conversation. Here's the next thing, verse uh, 17, don't be foolish, understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. That's part of seeking the Lord's will is, is that His Holy Spirit should be evident. His presence should be manifest in our homes. 
Then verse 19 says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Here's the next practice to cultivate. Have spiritual conversations. Have spiritual conversations. In our homes, with our spouses, with our kids, with our friends, like spiritual conversations should be natural to us. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, talking about Jesus should just like come out of our mouth. It should be a natural part of our home life, having spiritual conversations. Paul says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And encourage each other through spiritual conversations. When you correct your children, it should be through spiritual conversations. This is not just about behavior modification, following the rules. This is about living a life that is conformed to the image of Christ. Spiritual conversations in your relationship with your spouse. You should be talking about what you're learning, how you're growing. Spiritual conversations. Now, my wife and I, uh, we, we have spiritual conversations with each other, but we don't like necessarily do the same thing. So, there are, so it might work for you in your house to like do a devotion together, right? Maybe you read a book together, you can read it on your own, you can read it together. For us, we just don't do that. It doesn't work. We've, we've tried it. And, uh, but what we do is I, what I'm learning, how I'm growing in my quiet time and the books I'm reading and, 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 and when I'm studying and getting ready for a message and whatever she's learning and whatever book she's reading, we just talk about it. And, and I say, hey, I was working on the message this week and I'm so excited about this. And she'll tell me, well, I, I was listening to this podcast and, they, and this and this. And we just share those things with each other. I mean, if you're learning, if you're growing, then just share it. Just tell each other. And then listen. <laughs> if you're on the other side of, of, of being told about something, listen. And, and share what God is teaching you. Ha just have spiritual conversations. Have spiritual conversations with your kids. If you tithe, if you give, your kids should know that you give and that that's a priority in your home. When your dishwasher breaks down, your radiator blows and, you know, you can have, that's a perfect time to have a conversation about how God provides for our family. We, uh, we got a pretty good tax bill this year, so that was awesome. <laughs> um, and God provided in a miraculous way. Honestly, it was like a bigger chunk than we were prepared for. And God provided, and, and we'll get to have a conversation with our kids to say, hey, God provided this. We weren't expecting it. Wish we could have spent it on something fun, but, <laughs> but God provided. Like, take those opportunities, have spiritual conversations, look for ways to have spiritual conversations. As a church, we try to help with this. When your kids are over in OBC Kids, when, they, when you go pick them up, you're going to get a little piece of paper that tells you what they learned. And, and you can ask them, what, what did you learn today? And have conversations about it. Don't neglect spiritual conversations because it's uncomfortable. And by the way, it can be uncomfortable. Because maybe you feel like, I don't, I'm not qualified, I don't have the answers. But here's the thing, faithfulness is enough. Faithfulness is enough. If your kids have some questions that are like above your pay grade, we have a room full of people who would love to walk through that with you. So just have spiritual conversations. Start with something easy. Talk about Jesus. Have spiritual conversations and then it continues. That, so that's that's uh, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And verse 20 says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this principle is this, that we would grow in gratitude. Now, it's easy. It's easy to get frustrated in our homes and our families. It's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get frustrated with our spouse. It's easy to get frustrated with our kids. It's easy to get frustrated with the bills. It's easy to get frustrated with the busyness. It's easy to get frustrated with messy rooms. It's easy to get frustrated when they don't clean their plate. It's like there's lots to get frustrated about. But what are we thankful for? I got some really good advice in the first year or two of my marriage from my father-in-law. 
we were at breakfast one day and he said, I, I just learned that I need to remember what I'm grateful for in my relationships. Like you're together, so there was something there. <laughs> so remember that. Be grateful for that. There are some days when you, you just are bursting with joy over those kids. Some days when you're not. But re remember, grow in gratitude. Thank God for the opportunity, for the privilege that we have. Grow in gratitude. When we focus on the frustrations, when we focus on the negative, when we focus on the hurt, when we focus on all of those things, then that's what will grow. That's what will be cultivated in our hearts. Bitterness, unforgiveness, frustration. But when we focus on growing in gratitude, those are the things that will be cultivated in our hearts. God will use those things. And the last thing is this, verse 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Submitting to one another simply means that we put the other's needs before our own. It's not about you. And the reason it's not about us is because it's about Jesus. And so we submit to one another. Why? Because of the fear of Christ. Because Jesus is our king. Because Jesus is our priority. Because Jesus is the one that we value because Jesus is the foundation, because Jesus is the cornerstone. And because of that, then we focus on others instead of ourselves. When we focus on Jesus, it causes us to focus on others instead of ourselves because Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And how did I love you? I gave my life for you. And so here's the last thing in cultivating intentional families, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord simply means that he is the value, he is the priority, he is the, he is the one that, that compels us, that drives us, that, that influences all of our decisions. He is the king, he is God. He's the centerpiece of our homes, he's the boss. He's the one who calls the shots. And we can fear not being our kid's best friend. We can fear not getting as much out of our marriage as we're putting in. We can fear not keeping up with the Joneses. We can fear that our kids didn't make the travel ball team. We can fear that our kids didn't get the right grades. We can fear that we didn't win yard of the month. I don't know. There's a lot of things we can fear when it comes to family life. I wish my neighborhood did yard of the month because I'm trying so hard, but <laughs> I digress. But when we fear the Lord, when we fear the Lord, then that kind of sets the priorities for our home. It's kind of like what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things, all of these other things that you're seeking, that you're, that you're looking for, those things will come along too. It's kind of like the song that we sang this morning, Christ be magnified be on the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. And when we magnify Christ, then all of those other things, they'll come along too. When we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and when we sing how marvelous, how wonderful, then all of those other things, they'll come along too. The fear of the Lord, the book of Proverbs says, is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so this morning, we're going to have a time to respond. A time of prayer. And maybe you have not been making the most of the time. Maybe your time priorities have been off and you need to come and say, Lord, help me. 
Maybe you haven't been seeking the Lord's will. You've been seeking a lot of things, approval, success, but not God's plan. Maybe you you just don't have spiritual conversations in your home. God, and you can just pray, God, help us. Help us to have spiritual conversations. Guide us in that. Grow me in gratitude, Lord. Help me to not focus on the frustrations, on the negative, but help me to grow in gratitude for this family that you've entrusted to me. The last one is, Lord, help me to grow in, in the fear of you that you would be the cornerstone, that you would be the foundation. Like Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The rains came, the winds blew, and that house stood firm because Jesus was the foundation. That's what it means to fear the Lord. He's the foundation, he's the centerpiece. He is your all in all. You're not looking to other things, you're looking to him. So this morning, maybe you need to respond by just coming and praying and saying, Lord, today, help me to make the most of every opportunity moving forward. You can't make up for lost time, but you can start today. Lord, help me to seek you starting today. Help me to grow in gratitude starting today. Help me to Make you the priority of my home starting today. And you know what? He'll do it. And as you seek him and as you follow him, he'll work. He'll do what you can't do on your own. So why don't you stand up with me this morning? I'm gonna pray and then I'm just gonna give you an opportunity to respond. And you might respond by coming down here and praying. There's something Uh, really valuable about the physical act of stepping out of your comfort zone. There's there's like when you step out, it does something in your heart. There's there's like a, a connection to this physical action that takes place. And so maybe, maybe you need to do that today. Maybe there's somebody here, you, you don't have a relationship with God at all. So this idea of building your life on him You need to start it by just knowing Jesus as your Savior. And we would love to pray with you and show you how you can know Jesus as your Savior this morning. But after I pray, the worship team's gonna sing and you'll have an opportunity to respond and I hope you will this morning. So God, we love you, we thank you. Jesus, I thank you that you were so intentional with us that you always had time for people, that you invested. Even when the disciples didn't get it, you were patient and you continued to walk with them and teach them. And and you loved them to the very end. You gave your life for them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Jesus, you've called us to live that way with intentionality, putting others before ourselves. So Lord, help us to grow in that for your glory, for your kingdom's sake. Lord, that our homes would be a picture of your love for the world. People would be drawn to you. Lord, that each generation would declare your glory and your goodness to the next from generation to generation to generation. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the families that are here. And Lord, I thank you that you, your word says that you bring the solitary, the lonely into families. And Lord, we're not just a group of of families by blood, but we are families by spirit and we can walk with each other and grow with each other. So help us to do that. Lord, help us to respond however you call today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, I invite you to respond.